Okay, in this example, we're told we have liquid with a specific gravity of 0.95, flows steadily at an average velocity of 10 meters per second through a smooth tube of a diameter of 5 centimeters. And the pressure is measured at one meter intervals along the pipe. So at the inlet of the pipe, it's 304 kilopascals. One meter downstream, it's 273, etc. So you can see that the pressure is changing as we move downstream. So we're asked to estimate the average wall shear stress in the fully developed region of the pipe. So we're going to need to figure out what part of the pipe is actually fully developed. Maybe it all is, maybe only part of it. And then what's the approximate wall shear stress between stations 1 and 2 and state any significant assumptions we make. Okay, so let's get started by estimating the average wall shear stress in the fully developed region of the pipe. So first thing we need to figure out is where is the pipe flow fully developed. So the way that we'll check on that is we'll check the pressure gradient. Now, if you recall from analysis of pipe flows, one of the assumptions we typically make, like when we go through the Navier-Stokes equations and simplify it to get, for example, the Poisson solution for flow in a circular pipe, you know, we assume that the flow is fully developed, which means that the, the um, velocity profile is not changing as we move downstream. It also means that the pressure gradient doesn't change as we move downstream. The, 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 the pressure gradient is a constant. So we're going to check the PDX, oops, the PDX and see where that's equal to a constant as we move downstream. So the way we'll do that is we'll just take, let me erase this and write it differently. So we'll say the PDX is approximately equal to delta P over delta X. And so between these two points, the delta x is 1 meter, and the delta p we can calculate. And uh, if we do that calculation, this will come out to be the pdx will be minus uh, 31 kilopascals per meter. So you can see that uh, 304 minus 273 is 31. And then, so that's our delta p. And then our delta x is just 1 meter. So that's how we got that. We can look at those two points and do the same calculation. This comes out to be minus 18 kilopascals per meter. So you can see that the pressure gradient there is changing. So that means it's not fully developed. It's still in this entrance region. Okay, so then we can go between the 255 and 240. Do the calculation there. It's minus 15 kilopascals per meter. So it, it's still developing, although the change in the pressure gradient is getting smaller. So you can see from here, it went from minus 31 to minus 18 minus 18 to minus 15 here. So it's still developing, but it's getting smaller. And then we can go between those two, and that comes out to be minus 14 kilopascals per meter. So it's still developing. Do this one, it's minus 13 kilopascals per meter. And then finally, this one is minus 13 kilopascals per meter. So you can see that uh, it's right here is when the flow becomes fully developed. because the pressure gradient is no longer changing there. Okay, So we would say that uh, from four meters onward, the flow becomes fully developed because the change in the pressure gradient just remains constant. Okay, So in this upstream region, the flow is still in the entrance region. It's still not yet fully developed. But down here in this yellow part, it is fully developed. So we'll say uh, fully developed flow for four meters and larger. Okay, with the pressure drop being, so the DPDX being minus 13 kilopascals per meter in that, once it becomes fully developed. Okay, so now we're asked to find the w average wall shear stress in this fully developed region of the pipe. The way we'll do that is we'll just take a small, we'll do a, just a force balance on a small piece of fluid in the pipe. So we'll assume that we're dealing with a circular pipe we're told that the pipe has a diameter, so that means I'm going to assume that it's a, a circular pipe. So we'll just draw a little slice of fluid there in the pipe. This is the diameter D. And this distance we'll say is dx. It's just a very small distance in the axial or you know downstream direction. And then we'll do a force balance on this. So on this side, let's say that the pressure is P. So the pressure force would be P times 
pi r squared. I'm just going to do it in terms of radius instead of diameter there. And then over here, the pressure will, could be a little bit different because uh, you know we're moving downstream and we know that there's a pressure gradient, right? So the, the pressure is varying. So the force here would be p plus dp dx times dx. This is our Taylor series approximation times the uh, area, which again is pi r squared. Okay, so we've got pressure forces on either side, and then we also have a shear stress acting around the perimeter of this. And so that'll be the wall shear stress. So I'll make it, uh, uh, we'll call it the average wall shear stress. It's the average as you go all the way around. Since the pipe flow is axisymmetric, the average wall shear stress and the exact wall shear stress are the same. Because it's axisymmetric, it, there's no reason it would be varying as you go around. So we'll just leave it as average wall shear stress. And the area over which that acts is the circumference, which would be 2 pi r times the width, so dx. And uh, since it's fully developed, the momentum coming in from the left side and the momentum flux going out from the right side are exactly the same because the velocity profile looks the same. So we can go ahead and then just sum forces in the x direction here. Again, because the flow is fully developed, there is no variation in the momentum flux coming in and going out, so we don't have to worry about those. So summing forces in the x direction, we have pi, I'm sorry, pressure times pi r squared pointing in the positive x direction. I'm saying the positive x direction is this way. And then we have p plus dp dx times dx times pi r squared pushing back the other way. And then we also have our wall shear stress force. And then we can go ahead and simplify this. You'll see this term cancels out with that term. And then we'll get tau w times 2 pi r dx is equal to minus dp dx times dx times pi r squared. dx's will divide through. The pi will divide through. One of the r's divides out. And we're left with um, minus r over 2 times dp dx. So that's our wall shear stress in this fully developed region. And uh, since we know the values, we can plug them in, right? So we know that uh, R is equal to, let's go back up here. We're told that the pipe diameter is five centimeters. So the R is half of that. So this would be 0 0.025 meters. And we know dp dx was the minus 13 kilopascals per meter because that's the pressure gradient in the fully developed region. So we can plug those numbers in and calculate the tau w. And that comes out to be about 163 pascals. So that's the average wall shear stress in that region. So now the next part of the question is what is the approximate wall shear stress between stations one and two? So now here you can see that the flow is not fully developed, right? Because the pressure gradient is changing. So that means the velocity profile could be changing between the inlet and outlet. So we need to, so what we'll do to find the wall shear stress is we'll do the same kind of force balance analysis, but we need to take into account that the momentum flux coming in and momentum flux going out could be different. So let me write this in terms of the full momentum equation. So the linear momentum equation in the x direction. So we'll just write that out first. Since our coordinate system is fixed to the ground up here, we don't have to worry about any sort of acceleration term that might appear there. We're going to make a number of assumptions. First is we're going to say that the flow is steady. So we don't have that. I think that might have been mentioned in the problem statement. Yeah, we're told here that the fl if it flows in a steady manner. So we won't worry about that. Uh, we won't worry about body forces. We'll say that the pipe's horizontal. So there is no gravity in the x direction. The forces in the x direction are exactly the same as what we had drawn up here. Okay, so I'll just rewrite 
what we did. So it would it'd be pressure times pi r squared minus pressure plus dp dx times dx pi r squared minus tau w 2 pi r dx. So this part, again, these are all our surface forces. It looks exactly the same as what we had up here. Okay, so this is our free body diagram for this part. Now, the, the part that's different is this. Okay, so, you know, if I, if I had to kind of sketch this out, here's our dx. You know, we have some flow coming in and flow going out, and it's going to have some profile. Now, it's the differences in the velocity profile that would contribute to this momentum flux term. Now, the, um, the thing, though, is we don't really know what the velocity profile looks like coming in or going out. We're, we're not told enough information to figure that out. We just know the average velocity, but we know the velocity profile is changing. The thing, though, is if you take a look at the, the problem, we, the flow has an average velocity of 10 meters per second. The pipe diameter is about five centimeters. I anticipate that that flow will be um, that that flow will be turbulent coming in. It's the reason I say that is because it's such a large uh, flow, you know, a large velocity coming in, and uh, the diameter is a reasonable size. And if we're dealing, uh, we're not told exactly what the what kind of liquid we're dealing with, so we don't know the viscosity, but it's very reasonable to assume that we would be dealing with a larger Reynolds number, a Reynolds number larger than 2300. Remember, remember that the Reynolds number uh, for pipe flows is calculated in this way, where the diameter is the length scale. So the average velocity times the diameter divided by kinematic viscosity. And if it's greater than about 2300, then that means that we're going to have a turbulent flow. So I'm assuming, so it says state any significant assumptions you make. So I'm going to assume based on the large velocity and um, this diameter is, is, even though you might think five centimeters is small, it's actually pretty big. Um, that large velocity and that diameter, I'm going to assume that I'm dealing with a turbulent flow. And since the flow is being assumed turbulent, the velocity profiles for turbulent flows tend to be more averaged so that's not a great picture, but they tend to be more uh, blunt shaped. You still have the no slip condition at the walls, so it's still zero at the walls, but in the middle, it's pretty average looking. And the reason for that is because with turbulent flow, there's a lot of mixing going on, right? You've got all these, you know, at an instant in time, you've got all these vortices going on in the flow, and so the flow mixes pretty well. And because it mixes well, the velocity profile averages out the momentum differences between the different layers get averaged out. And so you get a, a cl much closer to average looking profile than you would if it was a laminar flow. So it almost looks like an average velocity profile coming in to begin with, if we're assuming it's turbulent. And it'll look more or less the same going out. Now it'll be a little different because the flow, the, the velocity profile is not fully developed. But my assumption is going to be here that this velocity profile and that velocity profile, even though they're a little bit different, they're not significantly different. So I'm going to assume that this term is about zero. It's going to be small. Okay, so this is this is my significant assumptions. Right? It says state any significant assumptions you make. So my significant assumptions in this part of the problem is I'm assuming that the flow is turbulent based on the diameter and velocity. So I'm assuming it's turbulent, and I know for turbulent velocity profiles, they tend to mix quite a bit, and so they tend to be more averaged or blunt shaped. And I do know that the profile will change from the inlet to outlet, but I'm going to assume that that change is small. So that's why I'm setting it almost equal to zero. It's not exactly zero, but I'm going to say it's small compared to these other terms here. Okay, so for this part of the problem, because of my assumptions, the average wall shear stress will look exactly the same what I had before, but instead of equals, I'm going to put an approximately equals to sign here. Up here, it's exactly equal because it's a fully developed flow. The, the, the momentum flux coming in and momentum flux going out are exactly the same. Here, that momentum flux term is not exactly equal to zero, but I'm assuming it's small because it's turbulent. And so my wall shear stress will be approximately equal to that. And if we go ahead and plug in 
our value for dpdx here and the radius, so the radius is still the same, 0 0.025 meters. The dpdx between one, points 1 and 2, or uh, locations 1 and 2 here, it's minus 18 kilopascals per meter. So let me write that down. So it's minus 18 kilopascals per meter. So if we plug those numbers in, we'll get the wall shear stress is about equal to 225 pascals. So it's a little bit larger in that region. And it's a little bit larger because the pressure gradient's a little bit larger in, in terms of magnitude. So, you know, it, to kind of recap, what we did here was to find where the flow was fully developed. We just looked at how the pressure gradient varied as we moved downstream, and we found here the pressure gradient was constant, so that means that's the fully developed region. In the fully developed region, uh, to find the average wall shear stress, all we did was do a force balance on a little slice of fluid. Uh, we don't have to worry about the momentum flux going in and out being different because if it's fully developed, it has the same velocity profile. So then we could find the average wall shear stress. For the entrance region where the flow is not fully developed, we did the full linear momentum equation because we know that there is a slight difference or there, there could be a there will be a difference in the momentum flux coming in and going out. But because of uh, my assumption that we're dealing with a turbulent flow because this velocity is 10 meters per second, that's 0 0.05 meters. You know, I'm assuming that, and typically that kinematic viscosity, you know, if, if you're dealing with water, that's something like uh, one times 10 to the minus six meters squared per second. So, you know, it, this is a, this Reynolds number is very likely to be large, so I'm assuming that this will be turbulent, and the velocity profile, even though it changes, it, I'm assuming it doesn't change by much. And so uh, that's why I set this approximately equal to zero. Okay, we'll go ahead and end the example there.